And uh, hello out there to everybody. I want to welcome you to our latest in our series of webinars. This one's on carbon saving farming. My name is Sean Sublet. I'm with you from Climate Central. And those of you who are new to Climate Central, I'll give you a little background about what we're all about. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. We've got people from uh, Western New York, Central Pennsylvania, Nevada, uh, as well as North Jersey. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, my name is Sean Sublet. I'm a meteorologist here at Climate Central. Uh, we're a nonprofit science and communications organization in Princeton, New Jersey. These webinars are part of our Climate Matters program where we work with 700 plus broadcast meteorologists and 300 journalists, 300 plus journalists across the United States, uh, providing them resources to help them tell their climate story specifically to their audience. Uh, normally I'd be joined by my colleague, Bernadette woods Plackey. She's stuck in another call, but she may join us a little bit later on, uh, but she certainly sends her regards. A little bit of logistics about what we're going to talk today. A general overview of what the science is telling us about soils, agriculture, carbon, and how they relate to climate change and ultimately sustainability. And we do encourage questions from the audience today. Uh, and to best do that, we ask you to use the chat function, direct the questions to everyone. And I, as your host, will moderate the questions to our guests. Uh, if you have friends who come on late, you need to leave early. I want to serve as a reminder that all of our webinars and the slides from our guests will be recorded and saved, ultimately uploaded to our website. Hopefully we can get that turned in 24 hours. That's at our media library.climatecentral.org slash workshops and webinars. With that, I would like to introduce our guest, Keith Hostian uh, from Colorado State University. He's a distinguished professor of Department of Soil and Crop Sciences and Natural Resource Ecology Lab there. His research focuses on soil organic matter dynamics carbon and nitrogen cycling. We're currently still working on, I guess, the next version uh, of a web-based tool for estimating on-farm greenhouse gas emissions, basically seeing how much agriculture you would be doing, uh, how, much, um, how much carbon you're putting into the atmosphere uh, at your farm, depending on what your particular farming methods are. A little bit more about our guest. Uh, he's a convening lead author of the IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories. And he's on the National Academy of Sciences Committee to research carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. So with all of that, uh, I'm going to uh, take a moment to unshare my screen and, uh, and ask Keith. There's Keith. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate you joining us and, uh, and you may take it away from here, sir. Okay, I'll uh, see if I can get this fired up. Okay, let me know if you see the slides okay. It looks good, it looks okay. good. Okay, that's great. So first I'd like to thank Sean and, and Climate Central for the opportunity to present the webinar here. Uh, and what I wanna do first is, is uh, provide a little bit of the kind of broader context for the, the topic that we're looking at here in terms of, of really two of the major uh, challenges that are uh, currently facing uh, humanity and the planet right now. Um, and the first global challenge is really about soil degradation related to food security, also agroecosystem resilience in, in particular in the face of, of climate change and increasing uh, uh, extreme weather events and these sorts of things. And, and this map is, is from, uh, from UNEP from a few years ago, but basically the idea I think to get across here is just, just that soil degradation is, is a problem and it's a problem uh, really worldwide, you know, certainly more severe in some places than others, but it's really a challenge and and we have to, uh, you know, going forward, we really have to start thinking about the soil uh, intensively and 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 to look at our, our managed ecosystems and and uh, confront this issue and, and regenerate our soils uh, to the degree, you know, that, that possible really. And to that end, the you know there's a lot that goes into regenerating soils and and uh, there's various forms of of soil degradation. I won't go into detail about all those different forms, but I just want to make the the point here that almost irrespective of what kind of problems or what kind of damage that soils have sustained, uh, typically 
soil organic matter, or what people refer to as humus, or uh, you know, or yeah, I guess to, just to, this to the organic matter in the soils is is arguably the most important attribute of the soil in terms of its its ecological function and its function as a as a productive. Uh, uh, productive ecosystem. So in terms of soil fertility and wa nutrient cycling and, and water holding and, and all kinds of things, soil biodiversity. So the, the point is that if we want to uh, improve our and reduce soil degradation, organic matter and increasing the organic matter in our soils is going to be uh, something that we're going to want to do almost everywhere. So that's the first point, first challenge. The second challenge, certainly, uh, I think, uh, familiar to all this audience and to, to most people by now, is is the issue of climate change and and uh, and greenhouse uh, greenhouse warming from how we've perturbed the atmosphere over the past, you know, particularly the past uh, uh, couple hundred years, in in particular, and in most in particular the last few decades. And this is, uh, you know, a couple of graphs that that. Uh, are you know you've you've probably seen in the literature basically this this one up over here on the upper right is looking at the emissions trajectories that are pro projected um you know over time um and and uh sorry about that uh, and basically what we want to do is follow this low emission pathway that is that is um, you know capping out with with atmospheric concentrations of co2 somewhere you know in the in the mid 400s if you will versus a, a business as usual or kind of a worst case scenario in which we which uh, uh, concentrations of of, uh, of greenhouse gases really become uh, you know more or less intolerable uh, and in order to follow that lower emissions pathway, and if we look over here at this bottom graph, you can see that if we want to uh, stay under two degrees mean net, uh, you know, global global temperature increase, uh, we're going to need to 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 stabilize emissions and stabilize concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, somewhere in in that lower 400s or mid 400s. Uh, and that's going to be determined by our, our cumulative emissions. And we're already obviously seeing uh, effects of climate change now. They're going to continue uh, to, to, to increase over time. Uh, and, and, and the next, uh, this, this slide here is, is really meant to kind of summarize the, the situation about what our emission profile is going to have to look like and how are we going to have to mitigate greenhouse gases going forward if we're going to have a hope of, of staying below this two degree um, mean temperature increase. And so this looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's really not. So over here on the left hand side, you see uh, global emissions in terms of, of uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. So this is looking at both CO2, but also methane, nitrous oxide, other greenhouse gases. And here's our kind of our current emissions profile. If we continue at boot business as usual, we're going to have uh, emissions growing until after mid-century, uh, perhaps coming down then, but we'll be in a, in a dangerous, a very dangerous situation with respect to to, uh, to to climate change, and instead the you know the general consensus is yes let's stay below this two degree pathway. In order to get here, we're going to have to be very aggressive in reducing fossil fuel emissions. But you note down here this this blue area it says net negative greenhouse gas emissions, and the idea is essentially we've already waited too long to uh, if you will to reduce our our greenhouse gas emissions. And so we're going to have to couple aggressive emission reductions now with a, a carbon dioxide removal uh, activity that will, you know, will, between emission reductions and uh, removal, uh, this is, is a possibility to stay on this red line, which takes us down to essentially a a net zero emissions profile before the end of the century. But to do that, we've got to have these net negative uh, emissions. We've got to have CO2 capture and removal from the atmosphere. 
So there's various ways to do this. And this is, again, uh, a figure that's taken from this National Academies report that came out last fall. And I won't go into all these different, uh, different methods, but some are more engineering-centric, direct air capture, for example, or biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. But there's also these natural capital or terrestrial land uh, uh, solutions, including afforestation, uh, reforestation, but also soil carbon here. And the, the thing that I think is exciting about soil carbon as one of many, you know, partial solutions to this problem is that it, uh, it, it has some real benefits in terms of, of what I mentioned before, also increasing the productivity and the, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the health of our soils, but also uh, it's, it's something that can be done with our land use systems kind of the way they are now. We don't have to convert large areas of land to other kinds of land uses in order to uh, to get this, uh, uh, the benefits of, of carbon sequestration in, into soils. And also, um, it's, it's something that's relatively cost effective at this time. So, and, and it's technology that to a large extent is ready to go. So let's look a little bit at what kind of options we might uh, be able to, to do to, uh, uh, to be able to, uh, um, to do this. And, and first, Joe, just a really quick explanation of and a kind of a, uh, a picture of what we're talking about when we're talking about soil carbon sequestration. So looking at this figure, it's a real simple kind of a, uh, an ecosystem carbon balance, if you will. So carbon dioxide enters the terrestrial ecosystem through photosynthesis. It goes into the plants. Part of the plants, uh, you know, in an agroecosystem, we remove a lot of the above ground carbon as, as harvested material, but also there's plant residues, roots, uh, non-harvested non materials that enter the soil. And so we've got, uh, we've got carbon going into this soil organic matter pool, if you will, that's there. But also that pool is being actively utilized as a food source for the soil and microorganisms and soil fauna. And so this other arrow that's coming out of this is, you know, is the, is the soil respiration. So normally in a native ecosystem, uh, these, these two fluxes come into balance and you approximate a, a, a soil, um, a soil organic matter content is more or less at a kind of a steady state. Now, what happened uh, historically as we converted um, as we converted systems to uh, to agriculture from either forests or native prairies and this sort of thing is we've depleted the soil organic matter. So we've we've had less inputs and and more outputs, and we've removed a lot of carbon through the harvest. So we basically are in a situation now in most agricultural systems where the soil organic matter content is, is quite a bit below, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 percent below what it originally was under a native ecosystem environment. So what we're trying to do then is to say, okay, how can we change management to try to rebuild some of those stocks? And basically, there's a couple of ways to do that. And one is, and it's pretty simple, just looking at this mass balance uh, diagram. And so if we can increase the carbon inputs going in, so more, more photosynthate going into roots and more, you know, more crop production or plant production over the year, more residues that can be added back into the soil, that can increase uh, the, the, the amount of, of organic matter that's maintained in, in that, uh, uh, in, 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 in below ground and the soil organic matter stock. And remember that CO2 that is being converted into organic matter, about 50% of that is, is carbon, is all coming from the atmosphere. So as we increase the, the storage of carbon in soil organic matter, that represents a, an actual removal from the atmosphere. Uh, we can also do things to decrease the relative loss rate of of, of carbon, at least over some period of time in, in, in terms of, of not stimulating the organic, uh, not stimulating the, the soil organisms as much. The, things like if we reduce our, our tillage intensity, then we, we get less, uh, less microbial activity and, and so we can reduce somewhat the outputs. And so that's, those are the general principles that we're looking at in terms of, 
of, of trying to manipulate that soil carbon balance in our, in our agroecosystems. Okay, so, um, and feel free to jump in if you have any questions along the way. Um, and there's, there's really a couple of classes of, of practices that I would point out that we could do that. And, and one I'll, I'll call sort of best management practices that, that already exist. We know how to do these. They're already deployed in many places, although they are not as widely deployed as they could be. So if we could get more farmers to employ these kinds of practices on more land area, we could increase carbon stocks overall. Then there's another class of, of practices that I'll call frontier technologies. And, and so again, this, this, uh, this kind of overview is, uh, stems from this National Academies report that, that, uh, that, that Sean had mentioned. And, and that's actually available on the web if you want to just Google National Academies uh, carbon dioxide removal or negative emissions report, you'll come right to it. Uh, but anyway, the, the idea is that there are frontier technologies, there are things that we could do to our agricultural systems uh, that we're not currently doing because we haven't yet developed some of the technologies. So really we've got things that are in an early state of development or we've got practices that have as of yet some significant technical or economic constraints to, to that, that are constraining their widespread spread adoption, but they could be, you know, utilized more uh, to a greater degree in the near future. Hey, Keith, um, John, real yeah, quick, uh, on the previous slide, when we talk about the, the BMP, uh, best management practices uh, that can be more widely adopted, um, do we have some sense of how widely they are adopted now, um, both domestically and globally, like some kind of percentage? Any, yeah. Do you have any kind of figure like that? Sure, sure. Let me, I'll, I'll go to the next slide to just show what those are, and then I can comment a little bit on that. Um, um, and so the, you know, here's examples of, and this isn't, this isn't including all of them, but here are some ex examples of existing uh, best management practices for, uh, you know, for improving soil health, sequestering carbon, but also, uh, you know, also, also reducing nutrient losses. And, and for the most part, these kinds of practices have a multiple set of benefits. And, and just kind of looking at these, I'll just kind of walk through really quickly. So we've got our annual crop systems that, and this is what most people think in terms of agriculture, that's not only what it is, but in a lot of our annual crop systems, if you think about it, they're in, um, you know, a lot of times we only have plants in the ground for for a few months a year, right? So we've got um, in, in the, the Midwest, for example, row crops, corn, soybeans, et cetera. You know, they're planted in May and harvested maybe in the end of September or October and the rest of the year, the ground is bare. Um, and a lot of times these systems uh, get fairly heavy tillage, a lot of soil disturbance. Uh, and a lot of these kind of systems can can actually be made more ecological by, first of all, you know, having a plant present on the ground as much as possible, because that's doing two things. It's capturing more, more, more carbon through photosynthesis during the non-cash crop growing season, but it's also preventing erosion. It's, it's um, you know, it's preventing nutrient losses. And then if we combine that with reduced tillage systems, such as no-till, very often in, in most kinds of, of systems, not everywhere, but in most kinds of systems, that reduction in soil disturbance, you know, again, is manipulating that carbon balance towards more inputs, reduced losses, and so you grow the size of that soil organic matter carbon box. Uh, similarly, if we improve our pastures, you know, again, it's about getting more productivity grazing systems, uh, maybe altering the, the rest period so that the plant recovers from grazing events. And, and, and we do things like, you know, in introducing legumes into the pastures so that the, there's more uh, fertility and, and not as much nitrogen uh, fertilizer requirements, et cetera. Maybe we've got some areas, this restored grasslands. We know that perennial grasslands have among the highest carbon stocks. And in some cases we've got land that is either too steep or, or for other reasons that it's not really that suitable for annual crops. Let's put those back into native 
type ecosystems, perennial systems like grasslands, we can get very high rates of, of carbon accrual and, and uh, you know, and recovery there. So these practices, so again, something like, you know, no-till and cover crops. Right now, I think cover crops in the U.S. is on, you know, something like less than 5% of the total cropland area. Uh, but in, it, it, it's, it looks like it's starting to take off now, and there's a number of farmers that are, are having really good success with cover, cover crops. No-till has been increasing in many areas. Uh, it's still not the dominant um, tillage system in most areas, although uh, in, in parts of the country, uh, it's up to, you know, probably, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent of, of the land area. Um, you know, improved pastures, uh, that's kind of like, well, there are a number of well-managed pastures, but in a lot of cases we can, you know, we can do better. And there's certainly a lot of, of, of suboptimally managed pastures where, where there's, uh, there's room for, for improvement, certainly. So I would say that, you know, in the U.S., but, but also, you know, worldwide, as you look around, we don't currently, you know, practice uh, to a great extent, the what we could do, what we know is is effective, and so there's definitely room to grow. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, that that's a very good answer. You know, my, I guess the other question you can address this now or later is, you know, how how difficult is it for for the individual farmer to to incorporate some yeah. of these these practices, how, you know, right. compared to the financial okay. cost. Of temporary no, that's a great one. Yeah, I'm going to, that's going to come a little bit later. So sure. we'll, we'll maybe just defer that till, till a bit. Good enough. Um, and so then, so those are things we can do now. And, and if we can incentivize farmers or, or just provide for, for greater, uh, you know, uh, adoption rates, then, then we can do a lot of stuff now with, with technologies that, that are already quite well known. Uh, there are other things, though, if we really want to start looking at, at our agricultural systems and maybe doing some things that are a little bit more out of the box. So, for example, enhanced root phenotypes on, on major uh, annual, annual crops, you know, corn, sorghum, uh, you know, things like this. Uh, right now, you know, for the crop breeders, I guess for our, our arguably for the past several thousand years, have really focused on, you know, on yeah, improving uh, the amount of grain production, you know, through genetic, through breeding, but also, you know, disease resistance, different things like this. And we haven't really turned loose, you know, crop breeders and stuff to say, hey, can we do some things to try to improve the the roots from the standpoint of, of having more carbon allocation, more root mass, uh, but also deeper roots. And one of the things as you as you get, as you add carbon through root inputs deeper in the soil, uh, the, the rate of biological activity in terms of microbial activity and, and decomposition processes tends to be less as you go deeper into the soil so that we know that, that uh, we can increase the, the residence time, if you will, of organic carbon uh, more at depth as opposed to the surface soil. So there's, there's a way in which we can enhance carbon storage through kind of looking at, at, at root structures on, on conventional crops that we grow now uh, and making them so that they, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're storing more carbon. Uh, another thought in the Land Institute out in Salinas, Kansas, together with now they've got a number of collaborators in different places are, you know, are looking at something quite out of the box, which is kind of like, well, do we, can we produce um, some of our, our, our grain and oil seeds and other things uh, through perennial crops instead of annual crops. Now this is a, you know, it, 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 I won't, don't have time to go into the, all the pros and cons about this, but, but Suffice it to say that there's the possibility about perennializing some of our, our what we now produce with, with annual crops is certainly a possibility, but it's, it's not something that, you know, can be widely deployed right now. Uh, but in the future, if again, research and development goes into perennialization, then that may be a, a growing niche in our agriculture. Other things like biochar or other kinds of, of manufactured organic amendments 
uh, again, are not widely deployed yet. They potentially could be more widely apply, up, applied. And, and so, you know, depending on economic constraints and, and, and other things, you know, we're not quite ready to do that. But these are examples of, you know, of technologies that in the next, you know, decade or two or, or, or longer could become potentially something to add into the mix. And, and once we do that, that further increases the, the technical potential for, for increasing soil carbon. So uh, just real, a, real quick, real yeah, quick before, we, before we jump on uh, further, Keith, um, one question from, uh, from our colleague, Ben Ryan. And I think I know where we're going with this, but how important is gene editing to developing these kinds of frontier uh, technology? So I'm guessing specifically for the root phenotypes and the perennial grains. Right, yeah. Um, that's a good question. It's, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's really out of my background. I'm, I'm not, you know, enough of a geneticist to, or I'm not a, any kind of geneticist in fact, but, but to, to, to really know that. But my sense is that that's a, it's in, in terms of increasing, um, you know, the, the cycle, uh, or, or uh, sorry, reducing the, the, uh, you know the cycle of of crop development. Uh, those kinds of of uh, you know of, of of gene editing and 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 uh, you know other kinds of more modern uh, genomic uh, uh, manipulations and stuff like that certainly offer um, you know opportunities to accelerate this process. You know, I think there's, I don't know personally if there are some of the same kinds of issues with um you know with with uh like there is with gmos or something like this that there are concerns about about uh you know ethical concerns or others that that are involved with that i i can't really you know speak to that i think you know to to a large extent i think there you know some of the work that's going on now certainly in the land institute i think most of their work to date has has focused a little bit more on traditional breeding strategies and things like this but you know i think i think that's a uh, a worthwhile debate I, I know there's there's other work i think the the salk institute is working on on looking at at whether they can increase the suberin contents of roots uh and i think they're looking at sort of gene editing or or more advanced uh, genomic uh techniques to uh, to, to kind of manipulate the, 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 the chemical composition of certain plant roots with the idea, again, as being partly something that could contribute to, uh, uh, you know, to increase carbon retention in, in soils. All right, that's good. Another, another brief question, I believe this one's from Nevada. Uh, throughout the West, wildfires have been wiping out huge swaths of sagebrush landscapes with invasive grasses like mm. cheat grass. Yeah. I'm curious if these types of grasses could actually help in soil quality for farming. So in terms of uh, in terms of, of well so is it, I'm not quite sure if I understand the question is the question that is going uh, of, you know trying to sort of eradicate or or mitigate cheat grass invasion in in the in the Great Basin ecosystems. Yeah, I think that's kind of where we're driving. Yeah, yeah, I think that's another. So that's an area that's you know, I guess arguably a lot of that, of course, is on public lands. Uh, you could certainly argue to the extent that those lands are grazed, that they're part of our agricultural land base, and but that's a you know that that's another example of there you're talking about sort of can you restore uh, a vegetated ecosystem and and reduce. Uh, you know, cheatgrass invasion, uh, that's a difficult task, but it, you know, that certainly could be, a, you know, a, a, uh, an option to both improve, uh, you know, improve the ecosystem health in general, the, the vegetation, maybe reduce fire uh, and, and, uh, and increase soils as well. I haven't worked in that area, but I think that's certainly a legitimate uh, area that, to, to look at. So it, it just points out that there's really, you know, there's a whole host of, of different kinds of things that can, can feed into here. Is that all right? Okay. That sounds great. Thank you. you bet. Okay. So then, uh, so looking at these conventional practices and the frontier techniques, so, you know, there's, there's some ideas that, we, that, that have been in the literature over the last really 20 years 
that have have tried to come up with estimates of you know what's the what's the technical potential so if we really did whatever was needed to get widespread adoption of these kinds of of practices you know how much would that amount to with respect to carbon dioxide removals if you will and so this is looks like a little bit of a com you know of a, of a of a complicated uh you know time series graph but it's really not so the, each of these columns are, are estimate you know published uh, or, or represent published estimates of of uh of of net you know greenhouse gas reductions and and carbon uptake by different you know globally uh and basically to it it what it, it comes to is that you know the and, and the bars kind of represent the range that were reported in the in the uh in the various papers but what i would do is if we look broadly at agriculture in general sort of including both cropland but also grassland so these kind of green uh green bars and you can basically say somewhere on the order to two to five gigatons or and a gigaton of co2 is is a billion tons of co2 per year that's kind of the range that a lot of these uh, studies come into. Uh, so it's a, it's a, and if we think back to the amount of carbon dioxide removal that is needed to attain this, you know, this, this, this Paris Accord, this less than two degree trajectory, you know, there we were talking about by mid century, something on the order of five to 10 gigatons per year of carbon dioxide removal. By end of the century, we're looking at, you know, maybe 10 to 15 or something like this. So this would point out to my mind, it's like, okay, soil carbon sequestration can certainly not do it all, but it can do enough that it matters. It can do, you know, perhaps 10, 15, 20%, uh, 25% even, uh, potentially of this carbon dioxide removal, particularly the more near term, the by mid-century. Uh, this one that sticks up was a paper that I had with colleagues in, in Nature a couple years ago, and that was one in which we also included estimates if these frontier technologies that I talked about before were more widely applied, we might be, you know, uh, quite a bit higher than that. But this again, the point I would make here is the potential is significant, so it's enough to matter. But again, what that potential translates to is, is very uncertain because it's really going to depend on, on, and this is what, uh, what Sean was mentioning a minute ago, how, how wide is the adoption of these technologies going to be and how do we make it so that that, uh, you know, that, that happens. And so I want to finish off here talking a little bit about that, that issue. Because really, it's like we can have all the technical potential in the world, but we've got to have it implemented. We've got to effectively, if we really want to make this happen at scale, we have to think about that we're going to have managed agroecosystems, which will look fundamentally different than they do now. They're going to be transformed. They're going to be radically better in terms of their ecological performance. And can we do it? And I think the answer is, is yes, but it's going to take a lot to do that. And the main thing that, you know, the point here is, you know, we're really going to have to be able to incentivize farmers and ranchers to adopt these practices. I, I feel like in many cases that once they're adopted, there's a good chance that in many cases they are more profitable, more uh, more productive on their own, so that they will be maintained over time. But of course, farmers are risk averse, and they are often uh, working on very thin margins. Uh, there's, you could imagine that if you change your system, uh, it may take you a while to figure it out. You may have to have some capital investment. You may have to have purchase some new inputs, etc. So can can society you know, provide for, you know, reducing that risk through various ways. You know, the answer is yes, and there are things that are going on now. They're not necessarily as, as widespread as they could be, but certainly government subsidies in, in most of the developing countries in the U.S., in, in Canada, and Europe, a certain amount of the subsidies that go in to agriculture from, you know, from taxpayers, if you will, it, you know, is directed towards conservation 
practice adoption. And so that is certainly uh, a way in which we've, we've had some improvements that have been happening, uh, you know, in part due to, you know, uh, government programs, et cetera. Uh, carbon finance is an area that's that's practically growing. You know, our farmers producing ecosystem services that are valued by society as a whole. So can farmers, in addition to producing grain, can they, if you will, sell carbon offsets? Uh, it's, a, it's certainly a nascent market, but it's, and it's, it's been around for, for a number of years, but it's not, you know, it's certainly not gone to scale. I would say the area that is perhaps getting most attention now recently is this area of what I'll call low carbon supply chain. So companies that want to incentivize their growers to, uh, to produce low carbon products. And for most agriculturally sourced products, if we're talking about, you know, fibers, wool, cotton, if we're talking about foodstuffs, a huge amount, so probably greater than 50 or 60 or sometimes even 70% of the total greenhouse gas footprint of that finished product, so your, your box of cereal or your wool cap or whatever it might be, are due to emissions that are occurring within the farm gate. So if we can improve the practices there, that's where the greatest potential for reducing the environmental footprint of that product is. Um, so we've basically got this policies, the, the policy type of solutions are out there. They're not maybe as, you know, they're not yet widely implemented to scale. But the point I want to make here really, and this gets to the last part of it, which is really, you know, what's the role of, of science and research in here? And, and I, I would say that any of these policies, whether they're market-based, government, et cetera, they really need reliable metrics. So we need to be able to quantify and verify the performance of these systems in terms of carbon storage or greenhouse gas reductions. And it's, a, it's a, actually a difficult job for a couple of reasons. And one is that these, as opposed to our industrial sources, you know, agricultural sources and sinks and, and removals, if you will, of greenhouse gases, they're dispersed across the landscape. They're non-point source. They're temporally, spatially variable. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are controlling those, those different processes. These are biogenic processes that, that humans through their activities are, are accelerating or accentuating. And just to give you an idea, so here's a cartoon that's out of the IPCC, but this gives you an idea. This is like the land use sector and what's happening with greenhouse gases. And so you can just get a flavor here from all the different activities, you know, whether you're growing livestock, you're adding fertilizer, the plants you grow, uh, you know, it, the, all the other stuff, there's multiple gases, there's, there's, you know, all kinds of things that are controlling those systems. So the, the point is that, that we can, you know, we can measure greenhouse gas fluxes, we can measure soil carbon change, you know, by taking samples and doing analysis. But in most cases, those, you know, to do it well really requires a, a little bit more of a kind of a, I'll call it a research environment or at least skilled people. It's not something that farmers are gonna do on their own, okay? They're not gonna measure their N2O fluxes, you know, while they're, when they're done, uh, you know, uh, planting their crop or something like that. So in, in, uh, that, in that vein, another question from our, our colleague, Ben, he is wondering what are some key areas, meaning geographic areas, uh, which such carbon finance uh, for farmers is being implemented, either you know globally or or domestically. Yeah. So right. So I would say that uh, that right now carbon finance for soils is is pretty limited. There are some projects that are particularly internationally where people are are looking at things like avoided conversion of native ecosystems to cultivated systems. Some I know some projects in Africa and other places where uh, it's relatively cost effective to do some of the measurement and, and monitoring kinds of activities. And, and so there are a few in the voluntary carbon market space. There are some, some projects that involve soil carbon, not huge. There's a, there's a company now by the name of Nori, which is trying to build a kind of a blockchain based uh, uh, carbon offset marketplace, if you will, that, that is designed to, kind of lower the transaction costs and, and, and maybe bring more 
uh, more of this to scale. Uh, but I would say in the carbon offset space, it's, you know, it's still pretty early days. It's not really uh, very large. It may grow. Uh, right now, I think the, the thing that I see that is, is most dif different now is that there are many, many companies now, particularly companies that have, you know, agricultural source products. And that's, you know, a lot of the Fortune 500 companies, if you start thinking about it. Um, there, there's a lot of, 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 of interest. Uh, a lot of it, I think, is, is qu actually quite genuine interest in lowering the environmental footprint of their products and being able to market that to a new generation of consumers and also to meet kind of corporate targets for, uh, you know, for climate performance. And so that's probably where the, 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 the space is moving the most rapidly right now. All right, good, thank you. Um, so anyway, back to, so, so in any case, and I think all of these market and, and non-market mechanisms are, are gonna be in play in the future. And I, and I think that's probably a good thing that there's a diversity of ways that, that, that incentives can, can, can work in the, uh, you know, in the system. Uh, and, and my point is, you know, from the standpoint of a researcher and, and a, a scientist, I think our, our, we have a real strong role to play in that is in terms of, of uh, you know, providing this, this reliable metrics to, to help give confidence to the market. And I think to do that, you know, we, like the, con the concept that my research group and a number of others, I think, sort of adhere to is we really need a, a uh, you know, we need a, a system of, measurement monitoring and verification that involves both measurement and modeling and remote sensing and i want to just kind of finish off by sort of giving a, a little bit of a view of what this looks like and again this is a, a diagram that's out of this national academy's uh, uh, research uh, uh, report and there's also uh, a recent carbon management uh, paper the, the journal carbon management that, that a group of us published in that that talks about this but you know and maybe this is a little bit too geeky but maybe there's a few geeks on that want to look at this sort of thing but anyway we're starting off you know we we need a strong empirical basis and we've got we're fortunate we've got a number of long-term experiments hundreds of them that have gone on for decades where they weren't really designed necessarily initially to look at co2 drawdown or something like that but they they they're, they were to look at ecosystem you know performance of different management systems as you change tillage or crop type or fertilization irrigation etc so we've got a lot of data that we already understand how soils behave you know we don't necessarily have enough but as as much as we'd want but we have a lot also increasingly we're getting you know soil monitoring networks where we're taking careful measurements over time in soil attributes and so this kind of empirical uh, information, you know, feeds into our models. We're using more and more process-based models that really simulate the dynamics of the ecosystem. Uh, and those models and data can really feed into this kind of idea of a scalable quantification platform where we start to bring in, you know, remote sensing and, and you know, and, and digital soil maps and, 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 and climate and satellite information, etc. So those all goes together in this idea of this quantifiable plat, uh, quantification platform. And then the outputs of that can really serve, you know, uh, you know really a range of, of kind of needs. Uh, on the one hand, they can inform us kind of at the local scale, at the farm scale, what's, you know, what's happening then with, uh, with, with farmers as they're changing their management and how might they improve their management in order to gain carbon in order to participate in ecosystem service markets or, or supply chains, et cetera. We also need this kind of data at the big scale. We need it at the national global scale for, uh, you know, for, for UNFCC and, and, and national reporting and, and global analysis, et cetera. I just want to finally, you know, finish off with an example of some of the work that we're doing here. We work also in the national reporting uh, some of the work in, in my group as well for the U.S. The, uh, reporting of greenhouse gas estimates, but I want to kind of focus on this stuff. What can we say at the farm scale? How can we, you know, begin to move forward on this? And, 
And here's what Sean had mentioned. So we've been working for a number of years on some, some tools. Uh, uh, Comet Farm is, is the main tool, but also Comet Planner is a derivative of that. And, and so we're already using these tools now and they're designed for farmers or really anyone that knows something about their management on the land can go online, on the web, it's, free, it's totally free. You can go in, you can zoom around with Google Earth and you can find your fields or pretend that you own that farm and, and, you know, and, and, and outline the fields and then you can put in your management systems and what management you'd like to try and you can manipulate all kinds of, of, of different things. And, and right now, you know, that these tools are being used. We can look at soil carbon greenhouse gases, but also uh, we're, we're building in new functionality to look at water and other soil health indicators. Uh, this is employs USDA's official entity scale greenhouse gas methods. It's used a lot then in, in you know, at the federal level for the National Resource Conservation Service and some of their conservation pro products, but we, or projects or programs. We're also working with, you know, state governments and, and, and companies, and, and I mentioned before, carbon, carbon finance, et cetera. Uh, Comet Planner is kind of a simple sort of a three-click tool that actually derives from Comet Farm. It doesn't give you the, you know, the most accurate estimates that you would have at your farm. It rather gives you kind of a more regionalized estimate of, of greenhouse gas emissions if you, uh, if you adopt certain conservation practices. But that tool now is, is used in California as part of the Healthy Soils Initiative. And we're starting to work with other state governments that are in the U.S. Climate Alliance and uh and states that are enacting uh you know soils uh soil mitigation programs and healthy soils things so it's it's you know there's there's getting more and more uptake of some of these tools so that brings me to final thoughts just really quickly um, i personally believe you know obviously agriculture is 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 extremely important in terms of of keeping us all alive and 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 that's a major uh, a challenge going forward to deal with, you know, food security, uh, you know, in the face of increasing demand, but also, you know, climate of impacts and, and things of this nature. But uh, I really think there's a, there's an opportunity that agriculture can do more than just that. There's an opportunity to uh, essentially change in a fundamental way some of our systems and how they look and how they perform to help stabilize the ch climate. And and I think that that's possible, but you know, it's it, we're going to have an agriculture that's going to look very different in the future, hopefully, and and that'll be good for a whole set of reasons. Uh, and so I have a very optimistic uh, vision of that, and 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 I think it's achievable. Uh, and and you know that's where we want to move to if we can. Uh, to do that, though, we're we're going to need to inform. We're going to need to incentivize farmers. It's you know there's a big lift here. It's a you know this is a uh, uh, a huge undertaking, I, I think, but just like dealing with climate change broadly through society, you know, we, we need to transform how we do things. And, and if we can do that, we'll be so much better off uh, at the other end. Um, and in terms of, you know, from a researcher's perspective, I, I really feel like the, the place where, you know, where myself and, and my colleagues and others can contribute the most right now is, or a, a big part of it is, is really in in developing the you know the measurement and monitoring verification kind of systems that will allow if you will give enough co confidence to the markets that will you know drive investment and uh, uh, you know and, and help drive this transformation of our of our managed systems to you know to this this better state. So that's all I had to present here. I'd be happy to take any additional questions. Pete, that's great. There's a there's a lot to to digest for those of us who are, who are not you know deeply uh, in this part of the science. Being an atmospheric uh, scientist, meteorologist, uh, this is fascinating and it's great stuff. It is a lot to process for those of us who who aren't in this uh, on a regular basis. I think the closing thoughts are are fabulous, uh, and we did have one kind of and it's a broader question if if, if you're willing to take this on, uh, given your expertise, uh, but. Question goes this way, uh, what's the best case scenario in your mind? How much change can be made in farming? How much impact would that have on the carbon balance? So that's kind of a, a very broad yeah. question, but 
But, you know, I guess what kind of scenario could you realistically or pragmatically construct where we, we start to see some of this stuff come to pass? Right. No, that's a great question. And um, so there's a couple of things, you know, one, one is in terms of, you know, do we want to have a, a kind of a, a you know, what's, what's a reasonable limit that you could put out there? And it, it's kind of an interesting one. There was a, a paper that came out a couple of years ago by uh, uh, Jonathan Sanderman, and, he, and they did some estimates that historically, through conversion of native ecosystems, uh, on the order of 500 billion tons of CO2 has in effect been lost from our, our soils globally. So yeah, we're going to regain that all back. No, we're not going to get that. Uh, but we're, uh, uh, you know, may maybe if we can get, you know, half or a third of that. And so we go back to this idea of, you know, five or six billion tons of, of carbon per year over a few decades. You know, that, that would be a substantial, uh, that would be a substantial contribution to this total CO2 drawdown that would be needed. So I think that's, you know, that's a big takeaway there. I, those are, you know, we know those things are technically possible. It's, I think the, uh, you know, I'm not saying they're necessarily easy, but uh, it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to fall on, on society and, and, and policies. And again, you know, some of the, I think there were several questions about, you know, incentivizing, uh, uh, you know, farmers and, and how we do that. And, and you know, I, I think it's, you know, but I think we need to take a long view. You know, we need to have ambitious goals. Uh, we're probably not going to achieve all that we'd like to, but I think, we, you know, we, we can afford to shoot relatively high and, uh, you know, and, 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 and do as much as we can, I think. Uh, so I, you want me to take some of the questions? I just uh, come with a few there. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were able to read them as well. Um, yeah, I, I brought up the, the Zoom group chat. So okay. just got from the bottom, there's, uh, so incentivizing farmers, what about the major players like Bayer, Monsanto, and stuff like this? Yeah, um, so that's a, so here's here's what I would say. I, I think it, um, you know, I, I think it's, it can be in the interest of agribusiness also to, um, you know, to, you know, to, to develop products or to work with farmers in a way that can deliver these ecosystem services along with other, uh, you know, with other goods. Or, uh, along with their, you know, their, their harvest uh, yields, et cetera. I, I do, you know, I, I have to confess, though, I, I don't, you know, I don't really know uh, if there, um, you know, if, if, if there are, uh, you know, if, if big agribusiness is necessarily conducive to sort of uh, maximum ecological agriculture. You know, I don't know. I, I, I want to be, I don't want to prejudge. I think uh, maybe, you know, maybe it's not, but, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think there's, uh, and I think probably our agricultural industry will also transform as a result of our transformation of systems. But, you know, is there a place for, uh, you know, for private enterprise and, and uh, you know, and, and agriculture, uh, agricultural business, you know, in this, in this space, I, I think there is clearly. And I think, you know, we're, we're not going to achieve uh, these kind of results unless we can effectively, you know, uh, interface with or, you know, work with, with agricultural companies uh, but, you know, the agricultural industry space is, is actually pretty, you know, it's a pretty diverse one. And, uh, you know, it may be that, that certain kinds of companies that have certain, uh, uh, you know, certain objectives are, are going to be more effective partners than others. I don't know if that's maybe too wishy-washy, but. Well, it's, it, no, it's, it's tough, but, you know, again, for many of us who do not deal with this 
in any way, shape, or form, at least to get some perspective to, so that we don't feel like, you know, there's a reason we feel lost. If you yeah. still are still kind of like, well, it's complicated, don't feel bad. Well, it makes yeah. us feel a little bit better. Yeah. But, yeah. but it is good to know that there are solutions out there. There is some theoretically low-hanging fruit that we can begin yeah. to implement, if, if you would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, one of the things that I, that, and it's, you know, it's a little bit more anecdotal that I, I think probably folks on here have, but, but there's some real examples and they're, you know, they're pretty heartening because there are some farmers now who have, who've really gone into what you would call, you know, regenerative agriculture. And, you know, some of them have written books about them. And, and, and yeah, I think there's, you know, I'm not saying that necessarily in all cases that we've totally been able to quantify and track and know exactly what's happened on those farms but for sure there are some people that are having success in in changing in a fundamental way in, in going to systems that have you know ground cover all the time they've reduced their chemical inputs they've got much more reliance on legumes and nitrogen fertilization they're they're reducing herbicides they're you know there's a, you know, a guy that says, yeah, I'm, you know, basically all of my, I'm selling all my iron, you know, all the tillage equipment and stuff that's sitting out in the yard. I don't need that anymore. And, and I, you know, I do minimum passes on the tractor. Um, and, and there, you know, it's funny because you, you read about farmers right now, there's a number of, you know, conventional farmers or a lot of them are in crisis, right? Because, uh, because of the trade war issues, the, you know, grain price are down, things like this. A lot of the farmers that are doing the regenerative agriculture things that are, they're seeing some real success because they're reducing their, their, uh, their financials, you know, dramatically in some cases where they're just saying, Hey, you know, I'm making, I'm, I'm making a profit and buying new land, uh, because I'm keeping, I'm having high yields, but my inputs have gone way, way down doing this. And so I wouldn't, you know, you couldn't get me to give up my cover crops. Other, you know, other more conventional farmers, they're, they're looking, you know, cover crops. Yeah, I'd kind of like to do that, but give me uh, some equip dollars because I got to buy cover crop seed now. That's, they're seeing that. And yes, the first couple, three, four years, maybe that you do that, you're putting money out, right? Because it takes time for the improvements to occur. But certainly there's good evidence from a number of growers that now, yeah, this has really changed fundamentally my system. I'm much more profitable. I'm going to, you know, I don't need incentives. I, I couldn't survive on my farm now the way it is working now. I have to have cover crops. I have to have these other practices. So that's, that to me is what's really encouraging. If people, if there is a sort of a transition and a, you know, a hump that they get over to another space entirely that is much more sustainable, much more profitable, much more ecologically, uh, you know, uh, high performance. Uh, okay, do you have time for the one more question? Oh, absolutely, sure. All right, uh, this is a follow-up, and this is this does begin to go into the business aspect as well, but this is from James Gilbert, who's in Western New York, uh, and you can read along. What about the growth of grains for beef? I feel like that's dominating the ag industry versus the growth of vegetables mm -hmm. for consumption by humans. Mm -hmm. There's been a, a social push lately for, mm -hmm. for non-beef and non-dairy lifestyle for sustainability. Yeah. And I think, and, and to be honest, so I, I, I think actually that's a, that's a great point. The dietary changes uh, in, the, in the developed countries is really important because, uh, and I'm not saying that there's, no, there's not a, I think there's a role for livestock in our systems. Uh, and actually, there, there's a, uh, an important role for livestock in some of these regenerative systems that, are, that have a lot more perennials and stuff in there that, you know, humans don't eat grass, but, but ruminants can. Uh, but I would agree. I think, you know, I think we should, uh, you know, we should have less beef, uh, certainly, but less meat overall and, and arguably, you know, less, less dairy in our diets. I don't think we, they need to be cut out entirely. But if you look at, you know, the, the, there's also the issue of not only diet, but there's also the, uh, the, the issue of food waste, which is a huge problem. In developing countries, basically 50% roughly of what we produce ends up you know, in the landfill, if you will, because it's not consumed. It's, it's, we, we, there's very few losses 
to the table, but then essentially we eat roughly half of <laughs> the food that goes that hits the table. You know, it is a little bit of a you know a simplification, but but there's a huge amount of food wastage that comes post consumption food waste. If you go to the developing countries, it's actually 50% of the food that's produced on the farm, roughly, never gets to the table because of harvest losses, because of poor storage and rats and, and infestations that, that, that take away the, the grain and, and harvest losses and things like this. So there's tremendous possibility by which we could you know, meet growing demands and actually if we can do it right to you know, improve diets, people will be healthier, they use less food that is, you know, less carbon intensive. We can reduce food waste both, you know, globally, wherever it's occurring. And that would allow us to, to not have to convert more land. And maybe we could take a lot of marginal cropland and put it back into native grasses and forests and things like this. So I think, you know, there's certainly a, you know, uh, a potential for some really good outcomes. Now, I'm not, you know, going to say that that's, you know, that's not necessarily going to be easy to, you know, we're going to have to make it happen and people are going to have to work hard. We're going to have to have, you know, uh, a major effort to, to accomplish this, but it's, I think there's, there's reason for optimism. Well, we like to have reason for optimism, so that's always good. Uh, Keith, we're just past the top of the order, so I'm going to let you, uh, top of the hour, so I'm going to let you go. Uh, but thank you immensely for uh, spending time with us and, and prepping and, and answering the questions and, you know, what's increasingly going to become more important as we go forward in time. That's yeah, great. Well, uh, my, my pleasure. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Terrific. Terrific. Uh, so, yeah, again, once again, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, right before we wrap, just want to share a couple other uh, little things. Um, again, to remind if you came in late, uh, we'll have everything posted up on our website, hopefully within about 24 hours. Keith's slides, and again, the recording of the presentation, that'll be at our media library, climatecentral.org. Um, they're CSU soil and crop scientists. Uh, you can go to soilcrop.agsci.colostate.edu. And if you have questions for me later, uh, if there's something you missed, you need to see, if you forget where to get the presentation, just email me at ssublet at climatecentral.org. And uh, save the date, I've been talking with some other colleagues in DC. Uh, those of you who've ever heard of climate models, because we know that's a big thing, uh, next generation of climate models nicknamed CMIP-6, they're coming down the pike. So we're gonna discuss, uh, we'll discuss those here uh, in a few weeks um, with our friend Claudia Tabaldi uh, in DC, the next generation of climate models. Uh, also regarding the soils, um, Tomorrow's Climate Matters comes out, uh, and that kind of dovetails on today's webinar, looking more at, at specific uh, figures to go along with soil carbon and, uh, and drawdown. So with that, I want to say thanks again to everybody. Thanks to Keith, and uh, everybody have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you again here in a few weeks, uh, first week in December. Have a great rest of the day, and have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.